So professional. Wait, no. That's the cue. Now we go. Welcome to the Between Two Sheets podcast, where we bring you interesting people from around the world and plucky. Now, uh, our special guest... <laughs> That's my humor. Stop using my humor against me, James. Our, Jesus. our special guest for today is none other than the Pluckster, and uh, we're going to nerd out with you guys today. This is going to be a nerdy podcast, so you, if you're not into numbers and techie stuff, just turn it off now. Mm. If you would like to learn something, and heaven forbid you went to YouTube to learn something else and then stumbled onto this, we are going to take you through a journey on how to assess a boat, not, not quite buy one or, uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to explain how to use the numbers of the boat to kind of just assess it. Not to say it's definitely good or definitely bad. Everything on a, on a boat is a trade, right? Mm, exactly. We're looking at ratios that give you an indication of a boat's performance, its sailability, its comfort, you know, how much it heals. So, uh, it's, don't be don't switch off people. There's not any maths in this whatsoever. There's a little bit, but not really. We'll explain it. It's all basically in PDFs that you can get from the internet of thousands of boats on a site called sailboatdata.com. And we're not representing them at all. It's just that it's a very convenient site. It is a very convenient site. And I don't think they're, um, they're getting any money other than ads. They put some ads on their site and, uh, yeah, absolutely go to that because they're non-biased. Mm -hmm. And these numbers are all, you know, put them into a calculator yourself, which you can d download online and you'll get the exact same numbers, which is kind of neat. So mm -hmm. they'll give you like an idea. Now, none of this is stone. None of this is like, okay, my motion ratio is better than your motion ratio, so my boat's better than yours. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. And there is no perfect boat. So I would like to qualify um, what James said. Sailboat data gets, uh, the information gets reported to them. So obviously it uh, depends on the bona fides of the people doing the reporting. So, uh, traditionally all the boats, all the manufacturers were very honest but lately they're becoming, um, I wouldn't say dishonest. They're giving a different view, but I can show you what to look for and how to not catch them out, but basically catch them out. Yeah. They're fudging the numbers, people. Yes. You got it. You got to. You're using my peoples now too. I like it. Yeah. You've, you've, yeah. Well, I know. I already, I always did that. Did I always you? did that. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you rub it off on me, buddy. Uh, we rub off on each other. Yeah, that's but funny. Okay. With our clothes on. Yeah, it was, it was oh, good. my God. Get, get that. Straight. Edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> no one can know. All right. All right. 40 foot monohull. Okay. Which, so, which are the ones? So, look, this is what we decided to do to, to, because this is a big subject and because there has to be some kind of example here, we decided to take seven 40 foot monoholes and, and show you the sailboat data on them from the site, like an actual screenshot of the site, and then explain to you what all the numbers mean and then put them into graphs together. So we picked a bunch of boats. Uh, half of them are old, you know, you can get them cheap, uh, you know, 40 foot range cruiser boats. And then the other half are, um, you know, newer production style boats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think yep. it's, I think it's a good round uh, approximation of the boats av that are available in this uh, foot range for the average consumer. And we're, we're, we didn't choose anything that's half a million dollars or like a race category, like an X boat or something like that. They're all, well, let's go over. Yeah, you, 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 he's yeah. got the better radio voice. So. Oh, thank you. Well, first, first in the stables is the Baba 40. The Baba 40 has a canoe stern and a cutaway forefoot. Uh, it's an old style built in Taiwan. It, they are awesome boats. They have, they're built in the Ta Shing yard, if I remember correctly. And they are quintessentially, they're, they're almost a cult classic, like the Bristol Channel Cutter or the Tayana 42. They're one of those boats where people say, oh, Baba, that's a good boat. And uh, you can see that from the craftsmanship inside. And what we're looking for is not so much on the inside or how it's laid out, but how the bottom profile is, how the how the keel profile is and the what, numbers. And We're just looking at physics and math. They yep, don't lie. Yep. 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 So, um, this one is a heavy displacement cruiser, um, a good sailor. And we'll see that later. Uh, next is the Beneteau Oceanus. And this one is 2011. You said, uh, no, 1997 first built. Oh, the first Oceanus. Yeah. Okay. So this will be a little bit of heavier one. I think it is. Let me check the thing. 
And uh, the Oceana series from Benetou is quintessentially... Uh, 1991, uh, 1991 first built. Cool. Sweet. That'll be a cool one to, to bounce against. You know what we should we should have done is put that one and put the... Uh, the, oh, new, the newer one. The newer one. Like a brand new one. Well, I did ask you for the list, James, about three weeks ago. <laughs> well, well, you know what? This isn't about the boats. This is about the numbers. This is about teaching these guys how to pick. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't really matter. They can do it by themselves. Exactly. They can go to it. Obviously, yeah. it's going to be a lighter boat. They used to build them heavier. So uh, the Oceana series is a very popular series for Beneteau. Uh, they sail great. They're a little bit more light displacement. They're a little lighter built. Uh, I've, I've discussed this before by, you know, buying a production boat that builds thousands of boats. They have to buy the cheapest materials. And, and uh, maybe not the, the construction of the boat is, is the cheapest, but the stuff inside will be. So next is the Bavaria 40, another production boat, uh, German this time. The other one was French. Uh, very similar, very similar characteristics. Although I think the Bavaria's got a higher, a taller rig, so they'll have more sail area. It's got more keel. Uh, two, two meter. Fairly well, uh, good sailing boat, and yeah, also fin keel, fin rudder, no no skeg, and uh, yeah, and I'll explain what all that stuff means if you don't know. Next is the Halberg Rossi Forty. Whoa, that, my favorite. Song. Yeah, that's my favorite too, actually, of, of this list. Uh, this is another, uh, just like the Baba 40, a uh, quintessential cruising boat. Uh, Hubbard Rossi's are famous for uh, being very strong, very good sailors, uh, real nice boats. I, I, I'm, I personally love them. I'm in love with the boats. Um, and they're a successful company. They're still, you know, plugging out the boats. They must around. be doing something right. They, they just, origi- actually, side note, they just came out with this coastal cruiser have you seen that where yeah. it's it's yeah. like super super light and uh yeah. people are saying it's just like what are you thinking <laughs> Harvard rossi <laughs> it's like a beneteau they're coming out with the beneteau mm-hmm. um and then next is the choi lee 41 this is one of my favorites this is one of the ones i, I did give you right yes i love this boat and it's not the the quintessential like best boat it's just it's pretty. The lines are cool. There's overhang on the back, which you don't see much, much anymore. Mm-hmm. There's, uh, which is going to fudge these numbers in a really cool way. We'll we'll explain that to you in a minute. Uh, I, this is one of my favorite boats. The next is a Formosa 41, which is a lot of people's favorite boats. It's one of my least favorite boats. <laughs> it's, what were you saying before the meeting? <laughs> I was saying it sails like a turd. Like if you took a <laughs> shit and put a sail on it, that would be the Formosa 41. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you edit that out? No. No. Uh, and then we're doing the Tayana Vancouver 42. Why did you pick the Vancouver 42? You, ch- you chose I that did, one. Did I? Yeah. Well, the only difference between the Tayana 42 and the Vancouver 42 is the Vancouver is not a canoe stern. So I, I, I think that it's my understanding that the whole canoe stern thing was just a fad. And then even Bob Perry that invented it was like, yeah, it doesn't really do, you know, that whole breaking of the wave thing that we thought it was going to do. It just makes the boat smaller inside, makes the cockpit tiny. Yeah, yeah. So they actually don't make boats like that anymore. You and don't have that rear locker. And yeah. All that. <laughs> yeah. And then you lose all your lazarette space. So it, yeah, it's probably good that you, you chose the, the 42. Although I, didn't. I have. <laughs> you stopped trying to get out of it. <laughs> I have friends on the regular Tayana 42 and they love their boat. Everybody loves the Tayanas. They're also in the same class as the Bavari, I'm sorry, the Baba and the Halberg Rossi where they are quintessential, um, not horribly expensive to buy, used and just good cruising boats. All right. Well, that's a good introduction. So how about we go straight to the Baba 40's uh, PDF file that you can Ooh, download yeah. from Sailboat Data. I'm actually really interested because I haven't looked at this boat in a long time, and I really, 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 really like this boat. Have you ever seen one of these? No. They're all teak inside. I mean, like, it's beautiful. It looks like a Hans Christian. Oh, really? Yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of built like a Hans Christian. Teak decks, all the entire interior is teak. It's a really nice boat. But they're not as expensive, obviously, because they're Well, they're, 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 like I said, they're, they're um, cult classic boats. So, yeah, they're super expensive if you get a nice one. But if you were around at the time when they were coming out, exactly. that would have been cheaper than yeah. the hands yeah. right? What? Okay. All right. So, take, take us away, Plucky. So what do we got? We've got the Baba 40. Um, straight away we've got the, well, it says long keel here, but it's not quite a long keel, is it? Yeah, they call this a cutaway four foot. But, yeah, it's a full keel boat. It'll, yeah. it'll track really well. And they do that because they cut, the, they cut away the front of it because it'll, it'll tack through the wind better. Mm. 
and uh, it'll go upwind a, a couple degrees more if it doesn't have that resistance. Going upwind is a is an inverse proportion to how much friction your your hull has. So if you have a very thin keel and very long, that with no friction, when in a flat keel you, uh, bottom, you can actually go upwind like to 25 degrees. But anything anything like that is going to pound really bad. So this boat is, is obviously built to like withstand a grounding, but they still wanted the, the sailing characteristics to be there. Okay, so we just keep on going. We'll look through. Uh, we've got LOA and LWL. What's 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 the difference? You, there? you explain this now. Oh, well, I, I'm I'm parched. I I, 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 you have a tea, my friend. <laughs> um, well, LOA basically just base. The only thing that that's going to tell you is how much it costs in a marina. Um, apart from that. Uh, it tells you very little. <laughs> that's, um, fun. that's funny. That's a great explanation. <laughs> well, uh, it's, it, well, it's not quite. It gives, it gives you um, more space, I guess. Your LWL is what factors into all the physics and the maths about the sailing. So that's probably the most important, uh, you know, sailing characteristic of a boat rather than the LOA. And what is it? L LWL, yeah. waterline length. So it's the amount, well, it's the... The boat sails to the waterline length. So where the boat touches the water, that total length is the waterline length. All right, uh, it's going through. So this one has, it's a 40-foot boat with a 34 and a half foot waterline length. Okay, yeah, cool. Okay. So there's five foot of overhang, like two and a half feet on either side. Yep, okay. That's not bad. Um, what do we got? We've got draft. Uh, then we've got your ballast and your displacement. Now we come to the sailboat calculations. I was just walking you through a few things they show you. So the sailboat calculations, what do you got? Well, first ratio is sail area to displacement. Second is the ballast to displacement ratio. Third is your displacement to length ratio, comfort ratio, and your capsize screening formula. And then there's this little S number at the end that uh, they, they give that for some boats. They give it for, um, they don't give it for some. So we're just going to ignore that one for today. We're going to focus on the top five. Yeah. Okay. So the first one, sail area to displacement ratio. There's your formulas uh, for those people that like formulas. It's much easier to work in metric. So uh, what, what, what is this? What, what, what does it tell you? Well, basically, what's the gist of the SA to D? Well, what the SA to D tells you, and it's actually a really important number. That's mm. the first number that I look at on, when I look at that. And not just because it's on the top, <laughs> mm. but really, you know, that, that will tell you in just one glimpse how the boat will sail. Yeah. Um, Basically, it's like horsepower to a, a, a car body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the engine. It's like mm. how big is the engine in the car? Is it a, is it a stock car or is, is it a little bit souped up? Mm. And how this, uh, how the math works on this is you take the sail, sail area, which is, well, actually, why don't you... I'll take this one, you James. Have, don't you have a degree in engineering? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So you, you go ahead and take this one over. Okay. First of all, it's a dimensionless number, so you can actually compare it between a range of boats, right? I probably wouldn't go too far outside the range, but, you know, we're all comparing boats around 40 foot, so that's definitely fine. Um, so basically, sail area, meters squared, and you divide it by your displacement in meters cubed, um, because as a boat gets heavier, it displaces water, and that has a weight, and so that's in meters cubed, and you put it to the power of two-thirds. Now, you're probably thinking, that's one crazy thing. Why would you do that? It's to reduce it to back to meters squared, so you have a dimensionless number, so you can actually compare be between boats. Well, and that's why they and do that. so the, uh, the two numbers are both in the same... Unit. Unit. So they yeah. cancel each other. That's what dimensionless means. Okay. And if you're working in feet for our uh, American audience, the reason that they dis divide it by 64 is one cubic foot of water weighs 64 pounds. So they're, they're bringing it back into that same um, in, into feet. feet squared kind yeah. of thing. That's right. Okay. So um, to get a very high SA to D ratio, there's two ways you can do it. You can increase, increase your sail area. Or you can reduce your displacement, or you could do both. So basically, so you, basically, you'd have to have a taller mast. Taller just, mast. Just keep putting more mast on it. Yeah, yeah. Or just make it lighter. Or run the boat aground vigorously. <laughs> <laughs> In the old days, your sail area used to be measured by 
calculating the area of your mainsail triangle and the four peak triangle area. But sometimes they tweak these values and the four peak is like a hundred percent jib, right? Like a solent. Um, what they do sometimes is they put a genoa on. So your sail area is slightly wait, larger. Wait, 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 wait. We have to explain what the difference between a genoa and a jib is. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Because some people are listening to this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So jib goes anything under 100% up to what, 115 or 110 or No, it's, it's, it's 100% and less. So a, a jib is a, if you make a triangle from the top of the mast to the front of the boat to the mast, that's that triangle in the front. That's the four peak triangle area. Yeah. That, that is a 100% jib. Now... Uh, sail area has always been calculated by a 100% jib until recently, and boats have been pretty much lying about it. Uh, Especially catamarans lately. They, they tweak them up. They, they just extend that J number back, and they use, uh, like, say, a 150% jib, which would be 50% of the sail coming back behind them. What's well, a Genoa then, isn't it? That's a Genoa. Yeah, exactly. So I just wanted to make sure everybody got that. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So... They tweak that, and they traditionally also your sail area to displacement ratio used to use a boat half loaded, half fuel, half water, half food, and because that makes sense, right? You know that's fair. But um, now they're using light ship, and some are using an empty boat <laughs> I don't without without furniture and anything. Right. I, look, I tried to look it up. There's an ISO standard. Nobody on it. wants to. <laughs> nobody wants to tell you what that is. But literally, an empty boat. I don't think you can go anywhere because there's nothing in it. It's just a hull. Ours has a mattress, <laughs> and by a mattress we mean a hammock. So um, it's quite amusing. So. Uh, we're we're going to do another one of these on catamarans. They use light ship. A lot of these older uh, data might be... Um, half load? Half load. Might be half load. Yeah, okay. All right, so let's have a look at the graph. Okay, so this graph is telling you the water line length of the boat is on the bottom mm -hmm. and the uh, sail area displacement number is on the left-hand side. So these are that's how it's graphed out. So you can see linearly from the bottom to the top, the Formosa 41 is going to be the most underperforming of the boats we chose, and the Halberg Rossi and the Bavaria should sail the best, uh, just looking at this number. Mm. So basically, your Formosa is going to be motoring a lot unless you've got 20 knots, and even then it's going to be struggling. Yeah, it's just too heavy to, for the amount of sail that it has. It's like, you know, putting a 10-horse engine in a, in, a, in a big old truck. It's just going to be a, not a real fun thing to drive around. And you're happy with the Choi Lee at 14. So it's it's still, you, what, you need 15 knots to get it going? I just like the style of the boat. Mm -hmm. and you're just in love with it. You got a bit of a bias there. I do a little. Yeah. It, it does. It, from this number, it doesn't look like anything special, but the Baba is not very, very much uh, ahead of that. That's like 14.5. Mm -hmm. And the Tayana's a great sailor and it's at 15. Mm -hmm. I forget what, what my oyster is. I think it's like, I think it's not very good either. It's like 15 or something like that. Really? Yeah. I think I've got it, but that's another podcast. And I've figure. got, I've got a, I mean, this thing sails, man. Mm. But anyway, the, the Halberg is at the top with the Bavaria. Bavaria is quintessentially set, sailed fairly well. Mm, okay. So, um, what, what, so overall, what would you say would your minimum be if you were looking at a boat? I'd say I would, I would have to have a sail area displacement. If Seriously, right now, uh, above four, 14, yeah. That would be my cutoff. I, I, don't, I wouldn't buy anything under 14. Okay. Just because the way that they make boats now is so much better with the computers and, and the CAD drawings and better materials. It's better. just nice to have a boat that sails well, man. Mm. It's needs, it needs to be strong and it needs to be built well too. But I mean, sailing characteristics are so important when you're cruising because you need to run away from storms. You need to, you know, the more you tack, the more, the more, uh, tired you are after a sail. You know what I mean? Mm. Now we looked at your minimum. What would your maximum be now for a cruising boat going around the world? Oh yeah, so if it's too light, um, I'm thinking like 22 is probably maybe a little too high. I don't even know. I don't really. Th I haven't really looked at a lot boat. of boats like that. I wonder what the X yacht is. I'd like to know. It's probably like 24, 25. Yeah, miles. those are cool boats, man. I mean, I see a lot of people cruising around the world on these like really light, really fast, racy boats. And they must just get the shit kicked out of them. We we took. I'll just give you a story instead of answering that question. Okay. Mm. 
I took a boat across the Atlantic this summer. It was a Bavaria C-57. It was the biggest Bavaria they make. We're actually parked right next to one right now. And uh, that thing, what, <laughs> my girlfriend called the front cabin the room of terror. <laughs> <laughs> no shit it's and, a bit like my boat that's a room of terror but well, yeah, we don't sail anywhere. for different reasons <laughs> yeah because it was just so crazy to be in there and try to sleep you know it was just impossible mm -hmm. and that's that's what you're kind of measuring with these numbers is is it going to be comfortable yeah okay all right uh so i think um in a monohull i probably wouldn't go over 18 yeah, I think. I think that would be a little just a bit too lively. You can't cook. I mean, you'd be struggling just to cut vegetables up. I mean, Yeah, well, I mean, the Halberg Rossi is at almost 18. Yeah, but that's a great boat. Yeah, well. I'm happy with that. Give it a little more I'm padding then. Uh, maybe 20. Let's call it 20. All uh, right. Well, you go 20, I'll go 18. Okay, sounds good. You I'm know what? I really <laughs> like to sail fast too, so I, I wouldn't really be opposed to... Um, like a couple of months on one of the boats that are, that are really racy, like an X-Yacht or something. But to try to live on that and cruise around the world is tough. Yeah. Well, as I said, cruising. Mm. All right. So the next is ballast to displacement ratio. There's the formula there. Uh, you're saying, well, most boats, most boats are between 35 and 45%. You were saying a good ratio for you is what? Uh, I think, I think a good indicator for a stiff to non-stiff boat is about 35. 35 percent. And basically what this number is, is how much, how much of the weight of the boat is lead. So it doesn't give it, it, it doesn't really give. Or, or steel or, in, or steel or, encapsulated or, in concrete. Or concrete. If it's yeah. in Formosa. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what they were doing. This is ballast. Yes. You got to watch that people because sometimes it spalls within the concrete and it splits open the, um, yeah. The hull. But anyway, that's and, another story. And what this is measuring is the riding motion of the boat. So as a wave hit, hits the boat on the side, the boat will flip over, or not flip over, will heel over. <laughs> Pardon my <laughs> semantics. And then how much will it heel over and then how much will it tip back? One thing that this doesn't take into consideration is the depth of the keel and how they're making keels now with the bulbs mm. on the bottom. That's right. So it's, it's missing information. It's only an indication. Um, so we can, we can have a look at this, um, in action. If we look at the, this graph here and look at the ones on the far right, it seems that they are a little too tender, right? It, doesn't it? Um, yes. This is a tough one to look at linearly like this because it's, you're, you, you've mapped it out with waterline length compared to the numbers. Well, basically everything above the horizontal line of 35 or 40, because yeah. uh, according to mm -hmm. some people, 40% is your, your limit uh -huh. or you want anything over 40% or around that figure. Yeah. But these, the Bavaria and the Oceanus, uh, the Beneteau seem to be a bit low, but they're not actually when you look at their PDF files. So when you look at the PDF files right here, you notice that like, for example, the Bavaria, it's got, you know, a, a bulb at the end of lead and it's two meters down. So it's actually giving you a very good moment, even though the ballast is small because it's so far away from the center of buoyancy and the center of gravity, it's still got plenty of riding moments. So it's still stiff enough. And the Oceana still is, because again, it's got a bulb at the bottom as well. It's only at 1.65, so it's not as good as the Bavaria. And that's why you notice that the ballast, it's actually less. Oh, I, sh I, think it, I thought that number should have been more to, you know, to get it up with the Bavaria. Wait. See that? See, that's two meters there, depth, and it's 2,700 kilograms over here. And this is only huh. 1.65 at 2,400. And that definitely doesn't take into consider consideration that. The, bu the Bavaria yeah. will absolutely sail up. Be the fine. riding moment will be better. We'll be fine, yeah. yeah. So it's the indications, people. Yeah. You've got to look at everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's what this podcast is for. Mm. What's next, Blucky? <laughs> okay, the next we're looking at displacement to waterline length ratio. <laughs> oh, baby. And that is just how much weight is carried by the hull. We've got displacement to waterline length on the left-hand axis, and across the bottom we've got the waterline length. Uh, well, you can see this, this graph is kind of an inverse graph, so all of the ones that are super heavy are on the top, and all of the ones that are lighter and more tender on the bottom. 
Um, uh, yeah, this is perfect. This actually really explains these boats. The Formosa is gonna is gonna sail. It's gonna take a lot more wind to sail it, and the Bavaria and the Benito almost the same boat. So this this number really is an eye opener for me when I see when I think about okay where on this scale from Formosa being a shit boat mm. not shit but it, it sails like shit mm. and the Benito being a really good sailing boat Bavaria too very good sailing boat do I want something that's more like the Tayana where it's it's really heavy and it's going to take a lot of wind to move it or do I want a, something like the Hauberg Rossi where it's not so heavy and it's going to move in light winds and handle the heavy winds mm. well that's why we both like the Hauberg Rossi um, although, even though it's described as a coastal cruiser, according to this category. I don't listing, know where you got those numbers, man. I don't know. This, this, I, I got it from the internet. It must be true. <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and a Halberg Rassi is certainly not just a coastal cruiser. They are making now a coastal cruiser. Yeah. They the, just came out with one. Yeah, the, but quintessentially in that company, those boats were offshore cruisers and yeah. very, very good boats. And, but they're just a bit lighter and with great sail area. Okay, cool. So you got this one. Uh, the, he the heavier the boat, the more wind it's going to need. And then you got to look at the sail area. All right. Now this is a funny one. This is, remember I was talking to you about dimensionless numbers so you can compare between boats, you know, 10 feet apart, maybe 20 feet apart. Even though it's not that good an idea, this uh, ratio um, was made up in jest. I yeah, hear. yeah, yeah. Ted Brewer just like made it up one day and yeah. said, and said, "Okay, guys, we're just gonna kind of like make apples apples and try to get this boat to compare to this boat, and this is kind of, I guess, how comfortable it might be." And then everybody ran with it, and everybody's like, "Yeah, he, I've seen, th I've seen couldn't believe it." Very detailed posts on how my water lane or my comfort ratio is better than your comfort ratio, so my boat's better than yours. <laughs> So it's a funny formula. Um, the dimensions of it, or oh, we'll get into that later. Um, did you know, uh, because it's uh, not a dimensionless number, it actually has units and I couldn't find any units. Uh, so I actually made up units and my units are number of pillows. Oh, nice. I so, like that. So that's the comfort ratio. I you like go. it. Oh, the go. number of pillows you're going to need to sleep? No, no, no. It's as if how many, if you had 10 pillows, you're sleeping on 10 pillows, you'd be very comfortable. Uh, it's like the so princess the, and the pea. The whole, uh, the, the higher the pillow number, the more comfort you have. So it's I love it. Can you explain this to me though? Because this, this one is a little above me. Okay, well, look, a lot of these numbers is just random numbers. But if we look at the, the inner bracket, we've got 70%, which is 0 0.7 of waterline length. And then he's, he's got 30% of um, overall. Oh, he's, he's waiting. Yeah. He's he, waiting those numbers. He, yeah, waiting them, exactly. And so that's all he's doing. He's just trying to um, calculate the planar waterline area because that's the one that's going to get hit by waves. And, Got it. and basically affect the motion of the boat. Okay. So that's what I think. I mean, maybe it's not that, but I, it looks like that to me. Uh, it's all, it's in pounds, it's in feet. And you times it, wait, whoa, 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 oh, we're not done yet. We take 70% of the water line plus 30% of the LOA, put those together, times yeah. that by the beam uh, and... Yeah, beam well, to the 1.33. Oh, oh a little bit more of the beam, one yeah. and a third of the beam. And then, and then we, do, we do take that whole number and yeah. times that by 65%. And then that's the denominator. You need to then divide that into the displacement. Wow. Really? <laughs> yeah. He just came up with this on his, on his own, like, eh, this will be close. Yeah, but it, it's not that special. A anyone can make up a formula. Yeah. It's getting a dimensionless ratio. That's the trick. And he hasn't got it here. It doesn't matter. People still use it. So, and it's in the sailboat data. We're just explaining it. So, you know, for good or ill, the, here it is. And what's wrong with having a displace, uh, a number that's not dimension, dimensionless? Uh, well, as you start to get away a few feet either side, the numbers don't really compare apples with apples anymore. Okay. Now I don't know exactly what the cutoff is, but uh, if you're comparing just the 40, all bunch, all, all the boats are 40 feet, that's okay. But if you're going 40 to 43 feet, you're starting to get different apples. Okay. So it's not good. Certainly if you go 10 feet, I mean, that's just too far. Got it. So, um, basically comfort ratio, it uh, measures how quickly a boat reacts to the waves and the surroundings. Okay. 
Um, it's going to favor a heavier boat because it's got more inertia to resist a wave slapping it. Okay. It's also going to favor a narrower boat because it's going to be less planar area that's affected by the waves jostling it about. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting formula. Good on you, Ted. Yeah, everybody uses it. It actually is pretty, pretty accurate. Although sometimes you look at a boat and you're just like, what? I don't know about that. Okay, so... Uh, I, I want to see the, the, the graph. The graph? Okay, here we go. It's much the same as before. <laughs> Pillows. Yeah, well, that's the units. Oh, yeah, it's almost exactly the same graph as a, a, a displacement. Pretty much. But you've got different categories here, see, down here. So less than 20 is a lightweight racing boat. Um, 30 to 40 is a moderate coastal cruiser. They don't actually have a category for 40 or 50. I think someone made a mistake. <laughs> like, That's pretty cool. I couldn't find it. So if you do get a boat between 40 and 50, uh, buy a lottery ticket and you might win something. Looks like you're, you're from us 41. There you go. Oh, really? That's a magic boat. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah. yep, go. It tells me the same thing. Um, yeah. When I look at this, it, it tells me exactly the same thing as the other one. But, well, as you can see, it's all in the same order. And Yeah. Okay. All right. What have we got next? Ah, the well, this is an important one. Yeah, the capsize screening ratio. Do you know uh, where this came about? No, I don't. Ah. Enlighten me. Do you remember the 1979 Fast Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's where this came up. They came up with this after that to, to that's right, have some kind of number to measure boats so they could eliminate them from being a part of that race, right? A, a lot of people were doing um, using the rules. And uh, getting around certain safety uh, characters, uh, characteristics of boats and uh, getting to go on the race. And 15 people died. A whole lot of boats uh, sank. Uh, incidentally, a lot of boats didn't sink and they didn't even have any crew on them yeah, <laughs> at all. Yeah, 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 which is a whole different conversation. But step yeah. up into the life raft. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so it's, uh, I wouldn't say a complicated formula, but we've got a power of uh, a third here. So it's basically your beam divided by your displacement over 64.2. And that's, remember, to get it to the weight of water, the yeah. weight of water cubic foot of water. And I think it is, yeah, and it's dimensionless too, because beam is in feet. And this is to the power of a third, which would be feet cubed. So it is dimensionless. So you can compare between, um, you know, a range of sizes of boats. Perfect. Um, does it take into account everything, oh, this number? Does it take into account ballast? No, and it doesn't take into account the, uh, the depth of the ballast as well. No, this no, one doesn't. Not at all. In fact, um, again, it's only an indication. Um, you can't just rely on this solely. You've got to still look at the boat. Um, okay. And who came up with that one? Um... Mr. Capsize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nicely done. It's his screening ratio. Yeah. Good on you, Mr. Capsize. Good on you, Top dude. Top stuff. Okay, so what we've got here is if it's less than two, it's safe offshore. And if it's greater than two, it's unsafe offshore. And I've got here, if it's equal to two, you've got to buy a lottery ticket. I like that. Oh, I mean, I, I can't believe just that one number is, okay, this boat is unsafe. I think it was trying to get around a specific... IOC or IOR rule that people were trying to get around yeah. and making their boats unsafe. And so they went, oh, I know a way of getting around this. Let's just do the beam to this. And that yeah, yeah, but as we're cruisers and we're talking to the cru cruising community, yeah. you can't go by the IRC rules. You can't go by those racing rules. Those are, those are not in any way relevant to what we're doing. But this will tell you how the boat will... Uh, come back if it's flipped over. That's that's what this is. Yeah. If it's flipped over upside down, how easy will it come back right side up? Yeah. Or basically, it won't get there in the first place. Yeah. Because it's got the the adequate beam to displacement to what? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the word I'm after? To oppose that. All right. So Bavaria is right on the line. So is Oceanus. Uh, everything else is pretty well south of that two number, which is makes sense because these are all cruising boats that we picked, mm -hmm. except for those two, uh, the Bavaria and the Beneteau. People do cruise on them, but they are not um, quintessentially built for offshore, mm -hmm. offshore stuff. So, so we've looked at all the ratios. What's your favorite boat out of these Ooh. seven? 
thought you got to put like a little I don't, I don't have favorite it. boat star. Well, I, don't, I don't have this quality sort of music no. stuff no. on my no. in my boat. Jesus. Maybe we'll do a dual edit on this one. You can send me the I'll premiere se- file when you're done, yeah, and then maybe. I'll put in some little like that. quippy. Well, we're gonna play shit. this on both our channels anyway, simultaneously. Okay. Oh, incidentally, nicely done with the. Um, you did the podcast with me. I got like twenty three thousand views or something. Oh, did you? Good. And I put it in a day and a half after you, or two days after you. So good on you, buddy. I was, I was, I was impressed. All right. Yes. So my favorite. You want to say your favorite on the count of three? On three. Yeah. Not, not like three and then go. Just yeah. on three. One, two. How grassy. Yeah. There you go, people. Nicely done. So it's not too heavy. It's got great uh, horsepower to its frame. If putting it, you know, normal people's um, terminology and. Um, it's very nice inside. Yeah, it's a, they're it, beautiful boats. It, 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 it's a bit beamy. It's, it's quite beamy. I, I could go a little less, um, but still, I think out of those seven, it, it, it's a great boat. You know what I've noticed? I, I've been on a couple of 48s, which is the same same basically boat as I have, the 48 Oyster. And I've been on a couple of 48 and 46 uh, however Grassies. And I've noticed that their interior volume is a little bit less and their decks on the outside way wider mm-hmm. they made the deck a significant amount wider than the, than the oyster did the oyster was about maximizing interior volume the habergrassi was about maximizing more comfort and safety offshore mm. so i'm very impressed mm. and if i bought one just a little tip from a pro get the one with the uh factory made hard um bimini <laughs> yeah that's it Usually it's me that doesn't know oh, these man. terms. I can't speak English today. <laughs> Just one little quip, tip from a pro. If you do buy a Halberg Rossi, spring for the hard factory-made Bimini that's attached to the Dodger because it's like a room and it's super nice. And I mean, I don't care how much extra it costs. It's worth it. Well, actually, this is starting to sound very pro Halberg Rossi. Well, they're not paying us. It's just yeah. a nice boat. We, we, we just, uh, James gave me four boats and I went... Oh, James, give, we me, should have picked give, give me another four boats. And he didn't get back to me because he went off whoop, whoop. And so whoop, <laughs> whoop, whoops out in the sticks, people. And so I went, oh, I looked up sailboat data and I literally just went 40 foot, 40 foot, 40 foot. And I chose oh, yeah, the you Halberg did, you did, you did good. and the Beneteau and the Bavaria. Just um, Maybe yeah. we should do another one with some newer boats. So the people that are buying the new ones can be like, oh, hmm. really? But that's hard to compare, like a Bavaria with a Hansa with a, a Beneteau all the same length. Mm. They're going to be very similar numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that's about it, people. Oh, yeah, we're done? Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. I hope so. that helped uh, helped you guys out. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to add them in the comments down below on Plucky's version of this because he reads his comments. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Actually, there's there's one there's one more thing. Oh, is there? Yeah. So this this is my best strategy. I don't know if this is. I think it is. I think that's what you said. No. Well, but, yeah. Okay. So the best strategy for buying a boat, and we we've we've looked at the numbers, right? Okay. We've looked at all the numbers, but still, the best strategy I think to buy a boat is number one, sail them all. Read all the reviews, all the bad, all the good. Make sure those reviews are written by a non-biased party because almost every review in a magazine, those guys are getting paid, usually by the manufacturer to write the review. Mm. So, like, you might as well. You could go on, like, Cruises Forum and just look, you know, do a search of, say, Beneteau or whatever, or the boat you're looking at, and up will come tons and tons of articles on them and just read them. You, and know, you know who does? And they're going to be unbiased. You know who does very good on bias reviews is Bob Perry. If you can find uh, uh, Bob's Perry's review, because he, he does reviews on boats. And uh, if he has your boat that you're looking at, I would trust him. And and uh, also... Well, he, he did one on the HH44 that I wasn't too... Uh, yeah? I thought that was a bit uh, skewed Well, just recently. Maybe. So uh, I think cruising forum, just from ordinary people yeah. that don't have any, you know, that are just sailors, you know. Cruisers forum is the way to go. That's how I found all my boats. Yeah, do that. And um, also, look at the ratios. What we've just done. Remember, they're just an indication. Know their shortcomings, but look at the ratios. If you can, try and live on one for That's a few weeks. That's a hard weeks. one, though, man. Maybe, like... Well, I don't know. If you can... Well, it, you know, in a perfect world, if you can. Yeah. I mean, you should try and sail it, shouldn't you? 
you could probably volunteer to be crew on one or say, or maybe, maybe put something out on cruisers forum and say, Hey, look, I'm looking at a, at a Hobber Brassy 46. Does anybody have one plus or minus a couple feet and maybe take me for a sale? Yeah. Because that'll, that'll be, it's it'll be worth the money. I would rather fly to another boat to sail it than have a, have a surveyor come to a boat because the survey doesn't really tell you anything. Hmm. It just tells you what's wrong with the boat. And surveyors, and surveyors uh, quite often are just glorified salespeople. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sometimes they're biased. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I, I. Yeah. This is this is definitely the best strategy for me too. I would say, the review thing is kind of skewed. I, I just be, be be aware of you know what's going on in the but back, that's in, in the background on anything on YouTube in magazine. Oh, some, YouTube. Some, oh, some, some of these forbid. people are being paid to to say nothing but nice. They're signing NDAs to say nothing but nice things about these mm. boats that they're like. You can't take that. As an actual review, you the, just can't. The, the, there's a couple of YouTubers now, in fact, uh, promoting catamarans. Let's not talk about that. Let's let's just say you you need to be be careful about the the bias. Okay. Indeed, I like how when they're talking about how they're not biased, that they can't look at the camera. <laughs> that's amusing okay. to me. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Uh, yeah. So, you, are we done? Yeah, we, we're done. You still have a couple of frames of this. this no, nah, that, that was... Um, oh, that's all the pictures. Oh, do you want to go in that special case where they can try and fudge the numbers? Do you want to do that or are we done long enough? Yeah, well, you know what? If you guys are still paying attention, you might want to know how these guys can cheat you on okay. these numbers. And, and uh, we can prove that they are. Yeah, well, it, it's not... They're not so... I, I shouldn't, we shouldn't say cheat because they do give all your numbers. When you're looking at catamarans, however... They actually, uh, there's not so much data and so they can hide it, but they, this isn't that well hidden. I mean, if you just look at the sail area, the actual hundred percent. Um, okay. What's this? The Bavaria cruiser 40. Yep. If you look down here, this number 73.72. That's the sail area total. 100% that's the hundred percent for main peach. triangles. But then if you go up to the sail area up here reported, it's mystically, magically, 10% ten, ten more. Yeah, or more. That's exa- almost, oh, more than 10%. More than 10% more. No, no, it's right, it's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it's more. Like 11 Doesn't or 12%. Matter. Yeah. yeah. Well, so it's more. So what happens is when you're looking at the SA, the sale area to displacement ratio, you know, it's been given a bit of a lift. And that's because <laughs> they've given it like a 130 jib. Yeah. And I guess that's, the... that's allowed now? Uh, the the newer manufacturers are doing dodgy stuff by um, doing lightweight boats, empty boats to reduce your displacement, right? So it makes the ratios higher. And yes, the sail area, I really had to struggle, but that's in another podcast. And the and the cat manufacturers are making boats because they have those fly bridges on them now and their main sails like way the hell up in the air. They're having to put these humongous masts on yeah, them, right? Yeah, 27.9 meters, I think, is for an excess 15. That's nearly 100 foot, right? That's six or seven meters than a standard 48-foot boat. Wow. That's amazing. Just to, but it's not, it's not going to be great sailing boat. That's just to get the sail area to displacement ratio in an acceptable range so they can say, oh, but, you know, look at this. It's still pretty good. No. It's not, because where's your center of effort? Yeah, we're really, really high. They look funny. Yeah, they do. They look like a feather. I would, I would take one for free, though. No, I wouldn't. Not yeah. at all. Not at all. Hey. Anyone? So if you'd like to see the next podcast about catamaran specific numbers, you can click on this link right here, and that will be our... That's pod- going to come after this. Is that going to work? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, because we can do it after. Through the power of post-production. Oh, okay. Right. I don't know. <laughs> All right, people, I hope you've enjoyed that. It's um, it's not that hard. It's not rocket science, is it? Ooh. That's the fade out. That's the noise you get when your Grammy speech is too long and you, know, you got to <laughs> cut it off. All right. All right. Thank you guys very much for joining us. Yeah. I hope you learned something. Uh, like I said, if you want to watch part two of this and catamarans, click up here and uh, go to the next one. And... Uh, Have a wonderful day. Can you write some lyrics to this? This is how I dance, people.